Ponderings from the Memoirs of the Chevalier de Burke. I left Ruthven, it's hardly necessary to remark, with much greater satisfaction than I had come to it, but whether I missed my way in the deserts, or whether my companions failed me, I soon found myself alone. This was a predicament very disagreeable, for I never understood this horrid country or savage people, and the last stroke of the prince's withdrawal had made us, of the Irish, more unpopular than ever. I was reflecting on my poor chances when I saw another horseman on the hill, whom I supposed at first to have been a phantom, the news of his death in the very front at Culloden being current in the army generally. This was the master of Ballantry, my lord Durastier's son, a young nobleman of the rarest gallantry in parts, and equally designed by nature to adorn a court and to reap laurels in the field. Our meeting was the more welcome to both, as he was one of the few Scots who had used the Irish with consideration, and as he might now be of very high utility in aiding my escape. Yet what founded our particular friendship was a circumstance by itself as romantic as any fable of King Arthur. This was on the second day of our flight, after we had slept one night in the rain upon the inclination of a mountain. There was an Appen man, Alan Black Stewart, or some such name. Note by Mr. McKellar. Should not this be Alan Breck Stewart, afterwards notorious as the Appin murderer? The Chevalier is sometimes very weak on names. Return to text. But I have seen him since in France, who chanced to be passing the same way, and had a jealousy of my companion. Very uncivil expressions were exchanged, and Stuart calls upon the master to alight and have it out. Why, Mr. Stuart, says the master, I think at the present time I would prefer to run a race with you, and with the word claps spurs to his horse. Stuart ran after us, a childish thing to do, for more than a mile, and I could not help laughing as I looked back at last and saw him on a hill holding his hand to his side and nearly burst with running but all the same i could not help saying to my companion i would let no man run after me for any such proper purpose and not give him his desire it was a good jest but it smells a trifle cowardly he bent his brows at me I do pretty well, says he, when I saddle myself with the most unpopular man in Scotland, and let that suffice for courage. No, bedad, says I, I could show you a more unpopular with the naked eye, and if you like not my company, you can saddle yourself on someone else. Colonel Burke, says he, do not let us quarrel, and to that effect, let me assure you, I am the least patient man in the world. I am as little patient as yourself, said I. I care not who knows that. At this rate, says he, reigning in, we shall not go very far. And I propose we do one of two things upon the instant, either quarrel and be done, or make a sure bargain to bear everything at each other's hands. Like a pair of brothers, said I. I said no such foolishness, he replied. I have a brother of my own, and I think no more of him than of a coal wart. But if we are to have our noses rubbed together in this course of light, let us each dare to be ourselves like savages, and each swear that he will neither resent nor deprecate the other. I am a pretty bad fellow at bottom, and I find the pretense of virtues very irksome. Oh, I am as bad as yourself, said I. There is no skim milk in Francis Burke. But which is it to be, fight or make friends? Why, says he, I think it will be the best manner to spin a coin for it. This proposition was too highly chivalrous not to take my fancy, and, strange as it may seem, of two well-born gentlemen of today, we span a half-crown, like a pair of ancient paladins, whether we were to cut each other's throats or be sworn friends. A more romantic circumstance can rarely have occurred, and it is one of those points in my memoirs by which we may see the old tales of Homer and the poets are equally true today, at least of the noble and genteel. The coin fell for peace, and we shook hands upon our bargain. 
and then it was that my companion explained to me his thought in running away from Mr. Stewart, which was certainly worthy of his political intellect. The report of his death, he said, was a great guard to him. Mr. Stewart, having recognized him, had become a danger, and he had taken the briefest road to that gentleman's silence. For, says he, Alan Black is too vain a man to narrate any such story of himself. Towards afternoon we came down to the shores of that loch for which we were heading, and there was the ship, but newly come to anchor. She was the Sainte Marie des Anges, out of the port of Havre de Grasse. The master, after we had signalled for a boat, asked me if I knew the captain. I told him he was a countryman of mine, of the most unblemished integrity, but I was afraid a rather timorous man. No matter, says he, for all that he should certainly hear the truth. I asked him if he meant about the battle, for if the captain once knew the standard was down, he would certainly put to sea again at once. And even then, says he, the arms are now of no sort of utility. My dear man, said I, who thinks of the arms? But to be sure, we must remember our friends. They will be close upon our heels, perhaps the prince himself. And if the ship be gone, a great number of valuable lives may be imperiled. The captain and the crew have lives also, if you come to that, says Ballantrae. This, I declared, was but a quibble, and that I would not hear of the captain being told. And then it was that Ballantrae made me a witty answer, for the sake of which, and also because I have been blamed myself in this business of the Sainte Marie des Anges, I have related the whole conversation as it passed. Frank, says he, remember our bargain. I must not object to your holding your tongue which I hereby even encourage you to do. But, by the same terms, you are not to resent my telling. I could not help laughing at this, though I still forewarned him what would come of it. The devil may come of it, for what I care, says the reckless fellow. I have always done exactly as I felt inclined. As is well known, my prediction came true. The captain had no sooner heard the news than he cut his cable and to sea again and before morning broke, we were in the great minch. The ship was very old, and the skipper, although the most honest of men, and Irish too, was one of the least capable. The wind blew very boisterous, and the sea raged extremely. All that day we had little heart whether to eat or drink. Went early to rest, in some concern of mind, and, as if to give us a lesson, in the night the wind chopped suddenly into the northeast and blew a hurricane. We were awaked by the dreadful thunder of the tempest and the stamping of the mariners on deck, so that I supposed our last hour was certainly come, and the terror of my mind was increased out of all measure by Ballantrae, who mocked at my devotions. It is in hours like these that a man of any piety appears in his true light, and we find, what we are taught as babes, the small trust that can be set in worldly friends. I would be unworthy of my religion if I let this pass without particular remark. For three days we lay in the dark in the cabin, and had but a biscuit to nibble. On the fourth the wind fell, leaving the ship dismasted and heaving on vast billows. The captain had not a guess of whither we were blown. He was stark ignorant of his trade, and could do naught but bless the Holy Virgin. A very good thing, too, but scarce the whole of seamanship. It seemed our one hope was to be picked up by another vessel, and if that should prove to be an English ship, it might be no great blessing to the master and myself. The fifth and sixth days we tossed there helpless. The seventh some sail was got on her, but she was an unwieldy vessel at the best, and we made little but leeway. All the time, indeed, we had been drifting to the south and west, and during the tempest must have driven in that direction with unheard of violence. The ninth dawn was cold and black, with a great sea running, and every mark of foul weather. In this situation we were overjoyed to sight a small ship on the horizon, and to perceive her go about and head for the Sainte Marie. But our gratification did not very long endure for when she had laid to and lowered a boat, 
it was immediately filled with disorderly fellows who sang and shouted as they pulled across to us and swarmed in on our deck with bare cutlasses cursing loudly their leader was a horrible villain with his face blacked and his whiskers curled in ringlets teach his name a most notorious pirate he stamped about the deck raving and crying out that his name was satan and that his ship was called hell there was something about him like a wicked child or a half-witted person that daunted me beyond expression i whispered in the ear of ballantrae that i would not be the last to volunteer and only prayed god they might be short of hands he approved my purpose with a nod but dad said i to master teach if you are satan here is a devil for ye the word pleased him and not to dwell upon these shocking incidents ballantrae and i and two others were taken for recruits while the skipper and all the rest were cast into the sea by the method of walking the plank it was the first time i had seen this done my heart died within me at the spectacle and master teach or one of his acolytes for my head was too much lost to be precise remarked upon my pale face in a very alarming manner i had the strength to cut a step or two of a jig and cry out some ribaldry which saved me for that time but my legs were like water when i must get down into the skiff among these miscreants and what with my horror of my company and fear of the monstrous billows it was all i could do to keep an irish tongue and break a jest or two as we were pulled aboard by the blessing of god there was a fiddle in the pirate ship which i had no sooner seen than i fell upon and in my quality of crowder i had the heavenly good luck to get favour in their eyes crowding pat was the name they dubbed me with and it was little i cared for a name so long as my skin was whole what kind of a pandemonium that vessel was i cannot describe but she was commanded by a lunatic and might be called a floating bedlam drinking roaring singing quarrelling dancing they were never all sober at one time and there were days together when if a squall had supervened it must have sent us to the bottom or if a king's ship had come along it would have found us quite helpless for defence once or twice we sighted a sail and if we were sober enough overhauled it god forgive us and if we were all too drunk she got away and i would bless the saints under my breath teach ruled if you can call that rule which brought no order by the terror he created and i observed the man was very vain of his position i have known marshals of france ay, and even highland chieftains that were less openly puffed up which throws a singular light on the pursuit of honour and glory indeed the longer we live the more we perceive the sagacity of aristotle and the other old philosophers and though i have all my life been eager for legitimate distinctions i can lay my hand upon my heart at the end of my career and declare there is not one no nor yet life itself which is worth acquiring or preserving at the slightest cost of dignity it was long before i got private speech of ballantrae but at length one night we crept out upon the bolt sprit when the rest were better employed and commiserated our position none can deliver us but the saints said i my mind is very different said ballantrae for i am going to deliver myself this teach is the poorest creature possible we make no profit of him and lie continually open to capture and says he i am not going to be a tarry pirate for nothing nor yet to hang in chains if i can help it and he told me what was in his mind to better the state of the ship in the way of discipline which would give us safety for the present and a sooner hope of deliverance when they should have gained enough and should break up their company i confessed to him ingenuously that my nerve was quite shook amid these horrible surroundings and i durst scarce tell him to count upon me i am not very easy frightened said he nor very easy beat a few days after there befell an accident which had nearly hanged us all and offers the most extraordinary picture of the folly that ruled in our concerns we were all pretty drunk and some bedlamites spying a sail teach put the ship about in chase without a glance and we began to bustle up the arms and boast of the horrors that should follow 
I observed Ballantrae stood quiet in the bows, looking under the shade of his hand. But for my part, true to my policy among these savages, I was at work with the busiest, and passing Irish jests for their diversion. "'Run up the colours!' cried Teach. "'Show the blanks the Jolly Roger!' It was the merest drunken braggadocio at such a stage, and might have lost us a valuable prize, but I thought it no part of mine to reason, and I ran up the black flag with my own hand. Ballantrae steps presently aft with a smile upon his face. "'You may perhaps like to know, you drunken dog,' says he, "'that you are chasing a king's ship.' Teach roared him the lie, but he ran at the same time to the bulwarks, and so did they all. I have never seen so many drunken men struck suddenly sober. The cruiser had gone about, upon our impudent display of colours. She was just then filling on the new tack. Her ensign blew out quite plain to see. And, even as we stared, there came a puff of smoke and then a report, and a shot plunged in the waves a good way short of us. Some ran to the ropes and got the Sarah round with an incredible swiftness. One fellow fell on the rum-barrel, which stood broached upon the deck, and rolled it promptly overboard. On my part, I made for the Jolly Roger, struck it, tossed it in the sea, and could have flung myself after, so vexed was I with our mismanagement. As for Teach, he grew as pale as death, and incontinently went down to his cabin. Only twice he came on deck that afternoon, went to the taffrail, took a long look at the king's ship, which was still on the horizon heading after us, and then, without speech, back to his cabin. You may say he deserted us, and, if it had not been for one very capable sailor we had on board, and for the lightness of the airs that blew all day, we must certainly have gone to the yard-arm. It is to be supposed Teach was humiliated, and perhaps alarmed for his position with the crew, and the way in which he set about regaining what he had lost was highly characteristic of the man. Early next day we smelled him burning sulphur in his cabin and crying out of Hell! Hell! which was well understood among the crew and filled their minds with apprehension. Presently he comes on deck, a perfect figure of fun, his face blacked, his hair and whiskers curled, his belt stuck full of pistols, chewing bits of glass so that the blood ran down his chin, and brandishing a dirk. I do not know if he had taken these manners from the Indians of America, where he was a native, but such was his way, and he would always thus announce that he was wound up to horrid deeds. The first that came near him was the fellow who had sent the rum overboard the day before. Him he stabbed to the heart, damning him for a mutineer, and then capered about the body, raving and swearing and daring us to come on. It was the silliest exhibition, and yet dangerous, too, for the cowardly fellow was plainly working himself up to another murder. All of a sudden Ballantrae stepped forth. "'Have done with this play-acting,' says he. "'Do you think to frighten us with making faces? We saw nothing of you yesterday, when you were wanted, and we did well without you, let me tell you that. There was a murmur and a movement in the crew of pleasure and alarm, I thought, in nearly equal parts. As for Teach, he gave a barbarous howl and swung his dirk to fling it, an act in which, like many seamen, he was very expert. Knock that out of his hands, says Ballantrae, so sudden and sharp that my arm obeyed him before my mind had understood. Teach stood like one stupid, never thinking on his pistols. "'Go down to your cabin,' cries Ballantrae, "'and come on deck again when you are sober. "'Do you think we are going to hang for you, "'you black-faced, half-witted, drunken brute and butcher? "'Go down!' "'And he stamped his foot at him "'with such a sudden smartness "'that Teach fairly ran for it to the companion. "'And now, mates,' says Ballantrae, "'a word with you. "'I don't know if you are gentlemen of fortune "'for the fun of the thing.' but i am not i want to make money and get ashore again and spend it like a man and on one thing my mind is made up i will not hang if i can help it come give me a hint i'm only a beginner is there no way to get a little discipline and common sense about this business one of the men spoke up he said by rights they should have a quartermaster 
and no sooner was the word out of his mouth than they were all of that opinion the thing went by acclamation ballantrae was made quartermaster the rum was put in his charge laws were passed in imitation of those of a pirate by the name of roberts and the last proposal was to make an end of teach but ballantrae was afraid of a more efficient captain who might be a counterweight to himself and he opposed this stoutly teach he said was good enough to board ships and frighten fools with his black face and swearing he could scarce get a better man than teach for that and besides as the man was now disconsidered and as good as deposed we might reduce his proportion of the plunder this carried it teacher's share was cut down to a mere derision being actually less than mine and there remained only two points whether he would consent and who was to announce to him this resolution do not let that stick you says ballantrae i will do that and he stepped to the companion and down alone into the cabin to face that drunken savage this is the man for us cried one of the hands three cheers for the quartermaster which were given with a will my own voice among the loudest and i dare say these plaudits had their effect on master teach in the cabin as we have seen of late days how shouting in the streets may trouble even the minds of legislators what passed precisely was never known though some of the heads of it came to the surface later on and we were all amazed as well as gratified when ballantrae came on deck with teach upon his arm and announced that all had been consented i pass swiftly over those twelve or fifteen months in which we continued to keep the sea in the north atlantic getting our food and water from the ships we overhauled and doing on the whole a pretty fortunate business sure no one could wish to read anything so ungenteel as the memoirs of a pirate even an unwilling one like me things went extremely better with our designs and ballantrae kept his lead to my admiration from that day forth i would be tempted to suppose that a gentleman must everywhere be first even aboard a rover but my birth is every whit as good as any scottish lord's and i am not ashamed to confess that i stayed crowding pat until the end and was not much better than the crew's buffoon indeed it was no scene to bring out my merits my health suffered from a variety of reasons i was more at home to the last on a horse's back than a ship's deck and to be ingenuous the fear of the sea was constantly in my mind battling with the fear of my companions i need not cry myself up for courage i have done well on many fields under the eyes of famous generals and earned my late advancement by an act of the most distinguished valour before many witnesses but when we must proceed on one of our abordages the heart of francis burke was in his boots the little eggshell skiff in which we must set forth the horrible heaving of the vast billows the height of the ship that we must scale the thought of how many might be there in garrison upon their legitimate defence the scowling heavens which in that climate so often looked darkly down upon our exploits and the mere crying of the wind in my ears were all considerations most unpalatable to my valour besides which as i was always a creature of the nicest sensibility the scenes that must follow on our success tempted me as little as the chances of defeat twice we found women on board and though i have seen towns sacked and of late days in france some very horrid public tumults there was something in the smallness of the numbers engaged and the bleak dangerous sea surroundings that made these acts of piracy far the most revolting i confess ingenuously i could never proceed unless i was three parts drunk it was the same even with the crew teach himself was fit for no enterprise till he was full of rum and it was one of the most difficult parts of ballantrae's performance to serve us with liquor in the proper quantities even this he did to admiration being upon the whole the most capable man i ever met with and the one of the most natural genius he did not even scrape favour with the crew as i did by continual buffoonery made upon a very anxious heart 
but preserved on most occasions a great deal of gravity and distance so that he was like a parent among a family of young children or a schoolmaster with his boys what made his part the harder to perform the men were most inveterate grumblers ballantrae's discipline little as it was was yet irksome to their love of license and what was worse being kept sober they had time to think some of them accordingly would fall to repenting their abominable crimes one in particular who was a good catholic and with whom i would sometimes steal apart for prayer above all in bad weather fogs lashing rain and the like when we would be the less observed and i am sure no two criminals in the cart have ever performed their devotions with more anxious sincerity but the rest having no such grounds of hope fell to another pastime that of computation all day long they would be telling up their shares or glooming over the result i have said we were pretty fortunate but an observation falls to be made that in this world in no business that i have tried do the profits rise to a man's expectations we found many ships and took many yet few of them contained much money their goods were usually nothing to our purpose what did we want with a cargo of ploughs or even of tobacco and it is quite a painful reflection how many whole crews we have made to walk the plank for no more than a stock of biscuit or an anchor or two of spirits in the meanwhile our ship was growing very foul and it was high time we should make for our port de carénage which was in the estuary of a river among swamps it was openly understood that we should then break up and go and squander our proportions of the spoil and this made every man greedy of a little more so that our decision was delayed from day to day what finally decided matters was a trifling accident such as an ignorant person might suppose incidental to our way of life but here i must explain on only one of all the ships we boarded the first on which we found women did we meet with any genuine resistance on that occasion we had two men killed and several injured and if it had not been for the gallantry of ballantry we had surely been beat back at last everywhere else the defence where there was any at all was what the worst troops in europe would have laughed at so that the most dangerous part of our employment was to clamour out the side of the ship and i have even known the poor souls on board to cast us a line so eager were they to volunteer instead of walking the plank this constant immunity had made our fellows very soft so that i understood how teach had made so deep a mark upon their minds for indeed the company of that lunatic was the chief danger in our way of life the accident to which i have referred was this we had sighted a little full-rigged ship very close under our board in a haze she sailed near as well as we did i should be nearer the truth if i said near as ill and we cleared the bow-chaser to see if we could bring a spar or two about their ears the swell was exceedingly great the motion of the ship beyond description it was little wonder if our gunners should fire thrice and be still quite broad of what they aimed at but in the meanwhile the chase had cleared a stern gun the thickness of the air concealing them and being better marksmen their first shot struck us in the bows knocked our two gunners into mincemeat so that we were all sprinkled with the blood and plunged through the deck into the forecastle where we slept ballantrae would have held on indeed there was nothing in this contretemps to affect the mind of any soldier but he had a quick perception of the men's wishes and it was plain this lucky shot had given them a sickener of their trade in a moment they were all of one mind the chase was drawing away from us it was needless to hold on the sarah was too foul to overhaul a bottle it was mere foolery to keep the sea with her and on these pretended grounds her head was incontinently put about and the course laid for the river it was strange to see what merriment fell on that ship's company 
and how they stamped about the deck jesting and each computing what increase had come to his share by the death of the two gunners we were nine days making our port so light were the airs we had to sail on so foul the ship's bottom but early on the tenth before dawn and in a light lifting haze we passed the head a little after the haze lifted and fell again showing us a cruiser very close this was a sore blow happening so near our refuge there was a great debate of whether she had seen us and if so whether it was likely they had recognized the sarah we were very careful by destroying every member of those crews we overhauled to leave no evidence as to our own persons but the appearance of the sarah herself we could not keep so private and above all of late since she had been foul and we had pursued many ships without success it was plain that her description had been often published i suppose this alert would have made us separate upon the instant but here again that original genius of ballantrae's had a surprise in store for me he and teach and it was the most remarkable step of his success had gone hand in hand since the first day of his appointment i often questioned him upon the fact and never got an answer but once when he told me he and teach had an understanding which would very much surprise the crew if they should hear of it and would surprise himself a good deal if it was carried out well here again he and teach were of a mind and by their joint procurement the anchor was no sooner down then the whole crew went off upon a scene of drunkenness indescribable by afternoon we were a mere shipful of lunatical persons throwing of things overboard howling of different songs at the same time quarrelling and falling together and then forgetting our quarrels to embrace ballantrae had bidden me drink nothing and feign drunkenness as i valued my life and i have never passed a day so wearisomely lying the best part of the time upon the forecastle and watching the swamps and thickets by which our little basin was entirely surrounded for the eye a little after dusk ballantrae stumbled up to my side feigned to fall with a drunken laugh and before he got to his feet again whispered me to reel down into the cabin and seem to fall asleep upon a locker for there would be need of me soon i did as i was told and coming into the cabin where it was quite dark let myself fall on the first locker there was a man there already by the way he stirred and threw me off i could not think he was much in liquor and yet when i had found another place he seemed to continue to sleep on my heart now beat very hard for i saw some desperate matter was in act presently down came ballantrae lit the lamp looked about the cabin nodded as if pleased and on deck again without a word i peered out from between my fingers and saw there were three of us slumbering or feigning to slumber on the lockers myself one dutton and one grady both resolute men on deck the rest were got to a pitch of revelry quite beyond the bounds of what is human so that no reasonable name can describe the sounds they were now making i have heard many a drunken bout in my time many on board that very sarah but never anything the least like this which made me early suppose the liquor had been tampered with it was a long while before these yells and howls died out into a sort of miserable moaning and then to silence and it seemed a long while after that before ballantrae came down again this time with teach upon his heels the latter cursed at the sight of us three upon the lockers tut says ballantrae you might fire a pistol at their ears you know what stuff they've been swallowing there was a hatch in the cabin floor and under that the richest part of the booty was stored against the day of division it fastened with a ring and three padlocks the keys for greater security being divided one to teach one to ballantrae and one to the mate a man called hammond yet i was amazed to see they were now all in the one hand and yet more amazed still looking through my fingers 
to observe Ballantrae and Teach bring up several packets, four of them in all, very carefully made up, and with a loop for carriage. And now, says Teach, let us be going. One word, says Ballantrae. I have discovered there is another man besides yourself who knows a private path across the swamp, and it seems it is shorter than yours. Teach cried out, and in that case they were undone. I do not know for that, says Ballantrae, for there are several other circumstances with which I must acquaint you. First of all, there is no bullet in your pistols, which, if you remember, I was kind enough to load for both of us this morning. Secondly, as there is someone else who knows a passage, you must think it highly improbable I should saddle myself with a lunatic like you. Thirdly, these gentlemen, who need no longer pretend to be asleep, are those of my party, and will now proceed to gag and bind you to the mast. And when your men awaken, if they ever do awake after the drugs we have mingled in their liquor, I am sure they will be so obliging as to deliver you, and you will have no difficulty, I dare say, to explain the business of the keys. Not a word said Teach, but looked at us like a frightened baby as we gagged and bound him. Now you see, you moon-calf, says Ballantrae, why we made four packets. Heretofore you have been called Captain Teach, but I think you are now rather Captain Learn. That was our last word on board the Sarah. We four, with our four packets, lowered ourselves softly into a skiff, and left that ship behind us as silent as the grave, only for the moaning of some of the drunkards. There was a fog about breast-high on the waters, so that Dutton, who knew the passage, must stand on his feet to direct our rowing, and this, as it forced us to row gently, was the means of our deliverance. We were yet but a little way from the ship when it began to come grey, and the birds to fly abroad upon the water. All of a sudden Dutton clapped down upon his hams, and whispered to us to be silent for our lives and hearken. Sure enough, we heard a little faint creak of oars upon one hand, and then again, and farther off, a creak of oars upon the other. It was clear we had been sighted yesterday in the morning. Here were the cruiser's boats to cut us out. Here were we, defenceless, in their very midst. Sure never were poor souls more perilously placed, and as we lay there on our oars, praying God the mist might hold, the sweat poured from my brow. Presently we heard one of the boats, for we might have thrown a biscuit in her. Softly, men, we heard an officer whisper, and I marvelled they could not hear the drumming of my heart. Never mind the path, says Ballantrae. We must get shelter anyhow. Let us pull straight ahead for the sides of the basin. This we did with the most anxious precaution, rowing as best we could upon our hands, and steering at a venture in the fog, which was, for all that, our only safety. But heaven guided us. We touched ground at a thicket, scrambled ashore with our treasure, and having no other way of concealment, and the mist beginning already to lighten, hove down the skiff and let her sink. We were still but new under cover when the sun rose, and at the same time, from the midst of the basin, a great shouting of seamen sprang up, and we knew the Sarah was being boarded. I heard afterwards the officer that took her got great honour, and it's true the approach was creditably managed, but I think he had an easy capture when he came to board. Note by Mr. McKellar. This teach of the Sarah must not be confused with the celebrated Blackbeard. The dates and facts by no means tally. It is possible the second teach may have at once borrowed the name, and imitated the more excessive part of his manners from the first. Even the master of Ballantrae could make admirers. Returned text. I was still blessing the saints for my escape, when I became aware we were in trouble of another kind. We were here landed at random in a vast and dangerous swamp and how to come at the path was a concern of doubt, fatigue, and peril. Dutton, indeed, was of opinion we should wait until the ship was gone, 
and fish up the skiff for any delay would be more wise than to go blindly ahead in that morass one went back accordingly to the basin side and peering through the thicket saw the fog already quite drunk up and english colours flying on the sarah but no movement made to get her under way our situation was now very doubtful the swamp was an unhealthful place to linger in we had been so greedy to bring treasures that we had brought but little food it was highly desirable besides that we should get clear of the neighbourhood and into the settlements before the news of the capture went abroad and against all these considerations there was only the peril of the passage on the other side i think it not wonderful we decided on the active part it was already blistering hot when we set forth to pass the marsh or rather to strike the path by compass dutton took the compass and one or other of us three carried his proportion of the treasure i promise you he kept a sharp eye to his rear for it was like the man's soul that he must trust us with the thicket was as close as a bush the ground very treacherous so that we often sank in the most terrifying manner and must go around about the heat besides was stifling the air singularly heavy and the stinging insects abounded in such myriads that each of us walked under his own cloud it has often been commented on how much better gentlemen of birth endure fatigue than persons of the rabble so that walking officers who must tramp in the dirt beside their men shame them by their constancy this was well to be observed in the present instance for here were ballantrae and i two gentlemen of the highest breeding on the one hand and on the other grady a common mariner and a man nearly a giant in physical strength the case of dutton is not in point for i confess he did as well as any of us note by mr mckellar and is not this the whole explanation since this dutton exactly like the officers enjoyed the stimulus of some responsibility returned text but as for grady he began early to lament his case tailed in the rear refused to carry dutton's packet when it came his turn clamoured continually for rum of which we had too little and at last even threatened us from behind with a cocked pistol unless we should allow him rest ballantrae would have fought it out i believe but i prevailed with him the other way and we made a stop and ate a meal it seemed to benefit grady little he was in the rear again at once growling and bemoaning his lot and at last by some carelessness not having followed properly in our tracks stumbled into a deep part of the slough where it was mostly water gave some very dreadful screams and before we could come to his aid had sunk along with his booty his fate and above all these screams of his appalled us to the soul yet it was on the whole a fortunate circumstance and the means of our deliverance for it moved dutton to mount into a tree whence he was able to perceive and to show me who had climbed after him a high piece of the wood which was a landmark for the path he went forward the more carelessly i must suppose for presently we saw him sink a little down draw up his feet and sink again and so twice then he turned his face to us pretty white lend a hand said he i am in a bad place i don't know about that says ballantrae standing still dutton broke out into the most violent oaths sinking a little lower as he did so that the mud was nearly to his waist and plucking a pistol from his belt help me he cries or die and be damned to you nay says ballantrae added but just i am coming and he set down his own packet and dutton's which he was then carrying do not venture near till we see if you are needed said he to me and went forward alone to where the man was bogged he was quiet now though he still held the pistol and the marks of terror in his countenance were very moving to behold for the lord's sake says he look sharp ballantrae was now got close up keep still says he and seemed to consider and then reach out both your hands dutton laid down his pistol and so watery was the top surface that it went clear out of sight 
with an oath he stooped to snatch it and as he did so ballantrae leaned forth and stabbed him between the shoulders up went his hands over his head i know not whether with the pain or to ward himself and the next moment he doubled forward in the mud ballantrae was already over the ankles but he plucked himself out and came back to me where i stood with my knees smiting one another the devil take you francis says he i believe you are a half-hearted fellow after all i have only done justice on a pirate and here we are quite clear of the sarah who shall now say that we have dipped our hands in any irregularities i assured him he did me injustice but my sense of humanity was so much affected by the horridness of the fact that i could scarce find breath to answer with come said he you must be more resolved the need for this fellow ceased when he had shown you where the path ran and you cannot deny i would have been daft to let slip so fair an opportunity i could not deny but he was right in principle nor yet could i refrain from shedding tears of which i think no man of valour need have been ashamed and it was not until i had a share of the rum that i was able to proceed i repeat i am far from ashamed of my generous emotion mercy is honourable in the warrior and yet i cannot altogether censure ballantrae whose step was really fortunate as we struck the path without further misadventure and the same night about sundown came to the edge of the morass we were too weary to seek far on some dry sands still warm with the day's sun and close under a wood of pines we lay down and were instantly plunged in sleep we awaked the next morning very early and began with a sullen spirit a conversation that came near to end in blows we were now cast on shore in the southern provinces thousands of miles from any french settlement a dreadful journey and a thousand perils lay in front of us and sure if there was ever need for amity it was in such an hour i must suppose that ballantrae had suffered in his sense of what is truly polite indeed and there is nothing strange in the idea after the sea wolves we had consorted with so long and as for myself he fubbed me off unhandsomely and any gentleman would have resented his behaviour i told him in what light i saw his conduct he walked a little off i following to upbraid him and at last he stopped me with his hand frank says he you know what we swore and yet there is no oath invented would induce me to swallow such expressions if i did not regard you with sincere affection it is impossible you should doubt me there i have given proofs dutton i had to take because he knew the pass and grady because dutton would not move without him but what call was there to carry you along you are a perpetual danger to me with your cursed irish tongue by rights you should now be in irons in the cruiser and you quarrel with me like a baby for some trinkets i considered this one of the most unhandsome speeches ever made and indeed to this day i can scarce reconcile it to my notion of a gentleman that was my friend i retorted upon him with his scots accent of which he had not so much as some but enough to be very barbarous and disgusting as i told him plainly and the affair would have gone to a great length but for an alarming intervention we had got some way off upon the sand the place where we had slept with the packets lying undone and the money scattered openly was now between us and the pines and it was out of these the stranger must have come there he was at least a great hulking fellow of the country with a broad axe on his shoulder looking open-mouthed now at the treasure which was just at his feet and now at our disputation in which we had gone far enough to have weapons in our hands we had no sooner observed him than he found his legs and made off again among the pines this was no scene to put our minds at rest a couple of armed men in sea clothes found quarrelling over a treasure not many miles from where a pirate had been captured here was enough to bring the whole country about our ears the quarrel was not even made up it was blotted from our minds 
and we got our packets together in the twinkling of an eye and made off, running with the best will in the world. But the trouble was we did not know in what direction, and must continually return upon our steps. Ballantrae had, indeed, collected what he could from Dutton, but it's hard to travel upon hearsay, and the estuary, which spreads into a vast irregular harbour, turned us off upon every side with a new stretch of water. We were near beside ourselves, and already quite spent with running, when, coming to the top of a dune, we saw we were again cut off by another ramification of the bay. This was a creek, however, very different from those that had arrested us before, being set in rocks, and so precipitously deep that a small vessel was able to lie alongside, made fast with a hawser, and her crew had laid a plank to the shore. Here they had lighted a fire and were sitting at their meal. As for the vessel herself, she was one of those they build in the Bermudas. The love of gold, and the great hatred that everybody has to pirates, were motives of the most influential, and would certainly raise the country in our pursuit. Besides, it was now plain we were on some sort of straggling peninsula, like the fingers of a hand, and the wrist, or passage to the mainland, which we should have taken at the first, was by this time not improbably secured. These considerations put us on a bolder counsel, for as long as we dared, looking every moment to hear sounds of the chase, we lay among some bushes on the top of the dune, and having by this means secured a little breath and recomposed our appearance, we strolled down at last with a great affectation of carelessness to the party by the fire. It was a trader, and his negroes, belonging to Albany, in the province of New York, and now on the way home from the Indies with a cargo. His name I cannot recall. We were amazed to learn he had put in here from terror of the Sarah, for we had no thought our exploits had been so notorious. As soon as the Albanian heard she had been taken the day before, he jumped to his feet, gave us a cup of spirits for our good news, and sent his negroes to get sail on the Bermudan. On our side, we profited by the dram to become more confidential, and at last offered ourselves as passengers. He looked askance at our tarry clothes and pistols, and replied civilly enough that he had scarce accommodation for himself, nor could either our prayers or our offers of money, in which we advanced pretty far, avail to shake him. I see you think ill of us, says Ballantrae but I will show you how well we think of you by telling you the truth. We are Jacobite fugitives, and there is a price upon our heads. At this the Albanian was plainly moved a little. He asked us many questions as to the Scots' war, which Ballantrae very patiently answered. And then, with a wink, in a vulgar manner, I guess you and your Prince Charlie got more than you cared about, said he. Bedad, and that we did, said I, and, my dear man, I wish you would set a new example and give us just that much. This I said in the Irish way, about which there is allowed to be something very engaging. It's a remarkable thing, and a testimony to the love with which our nation is regarded, that this address scarce ever fails in a handsome fellow. I cannot tell how often I have seen a private soldier escape the horse, or a beggar wheedle out a good alms by a touch of the brogue. And indeed, as soon as the Albanian had laughed at me, I was pretty much at rest. Even then, however, he made many conditions, and for one thing took away our arms before he suffered us aboard, which was the signal to cast off, so that in a moment after we were gliding down the bay with a good breeze, and blessing the name of God for our deliverance. Almost in the mouth of the estuary, we passed the cruiser, and a little after the poor Sarah with her prized crew, and these were both sights to make us tremble. The Bermudan seemed a very safe place to be in, and our bold stroke to have been fortunately played, when we were thus reminded of the case of our companions. For all that, we had only exchanged traps, jumped out of the frying-pan into the fire, 
run from the yard-arm to the block, and escape the open hostility of the man of war to lie at the mercy of the doubtful faith of our Albanian merchant. From many circumstances it chanced we were safer than we could have dared to hope. The town of Albany was at that time much concerned in contraband trade across the desert with the Indians and the French. This, as it was highly illegal, relaxed their loyalty, and as it brought them in relation with the politest people on the earth, divided even their sympathies. In short, they were like all the smugglers in the world spies and agents ready-made for either party our albanian besides was a very honest man indeed and very greedy and to crown our luck he conceived a great delight in our society before we had reached the town of new york we had come to a full agreement that he should carry us as far as albany upon his ship and thence put us on a way to pass the boundaries and join the french for all this we were to pay at a high rate but beggars cannot be choosers nor outlaws bargainers we sailed then up the hudson river which i protest is a very fine stream and put up at the king's arms in albany the town was full of the militia of the province breathing slaughter against the french governor clinton was there himself a very busy man and by what i could learn very near distracted by the factiousness of his assembly the Indians on both sides were on the warpath. We saw parties of them bringing in prisoners and, what was much worse, scalps, both male and female, for which they were paid at a fixed rate. And I assure you the sight was not encouraging. Altogether we could scarce have come at a period more unsuitable for our designs. Our position in the chief inn was dreadfully conspicuous. Our Albanian fubbed us off with a thousand delays and seemed upon the point of a retreat from his engagements nothing but peril appeared to environ the poor fugitives and for some time we drowned our concern in a very irregular course of living this too proved to be fortunate and it's one of the remarks that fall to be made upon our escape how providentially our steps were conducted to the very end what a humiliation to the dignity of man my philosophy the extraordinary genius of ballantrae our valour in which i grant that we were equal all these might have proved insufficient without the divine blessing on our efforts and how true it is as the church tells us that the truths of a religion are after all quite applicable even to daily affairs at least it was in the course of our revelry that we made the acquaintance of a spirited youth by the name of chu he was one of the most daring of the indian traders very well acquainted with the secret paths of the wilderness needy dissolute and by a last good fortune in some disgrace with his family him we persuaded to come to our relief he privately provided what was needful for our flight and one day we slipped out of albany without a word to our former friend and embarked a little above in a canoe to the toils and perils of this journey it would require a pen more elegant than mine to do full justice. The reader must conceive for himself the dreadful wilderness which we had now to thread, its thickets, swamps, precipitous rocks, impetuous rivers, and amazing waterfalls. Among these barbarous scenes we must toil all day, now paddling, now carrying our canoe upon our shoulders, and at night we slept about a fire, surrounded by the howling of wolves and other savage animals it was our design to mount the headwaters of the hudson to the neighbourhood of crown point where the french had a strong place in the woods upon lake champlain but to have done this directly were too perilous and it was accordingly gone upon by such a labyrinth of rivers lakes and portages as makes my head giddy to remember these paths were in ordinary times entirely desert but the country was now up, the tribes on the warpath, the woods full of Indian scouts. Again and again we came upon these parties when we least expected them. And one day in particular I shall never forget how, as dawn was coming in, we were suddenly surrounded by five or six of these painted devils uttering a very dreary sort of cry and brandishing their hatchets. It passed off harmlessly, indeed, as did the rest of our encounters, 
for Chu was well known and highly valued among the different tribes. Indeed, he was a very gallant, respectable young man, but even with the advantage of his companionship, you must not think these meetings were without sensible peril. To prove friendship on our part, it was needful to draw upon our stock of rum. Indeed, under whatever disguise, that is the true business of the Indian trader, to keep a travelling public-house in the forest. And when once the braves had got their bottle of scoura, as they called this beastly liquor, it behooved us to set forth and paddle for our scalps. Once they were a little drunk, good-bye to any sense of decency. They had but one thought, to get more scoura. They might easily take it in their heads to give us chase, and had we been overtaken, I had never written these memoirs. We were come to the most critical portion of our course, where we might equally expect to fall into the hands of French or English, when a terrible calamity befell us. Chu was taken suddenly sick with symptoms like those of poison, and in the course of a few hours expired in the bottom of the canoe. We thus lost at once our guide, our interpreter, our boatman, and our passport, for he was all these in one and found ourselves reduced, at a blow, to the most desperate and irremediable distress. Chu, who took a great pride in his knowledge, had indeed often lectured us on the geography, and Ballantrae, I believe, would listen. But for my part, I have always found such information highly tedious, and beyond the fact that we were now in the country of the Adirondack Indians, and not so distant from our destination, could we but have found the way, I was entirely ignorant. The wisdom of my course was soon the more apparent, for with all his pains, Ballantrae was no further advanced than myself. He knew we must continue to go up one stream, then by the way of a portage down another, and then up a third. But you are to consider in a mountain country how many streams come rolling in from every hand and how is a gentleman who is a perfect stranger in that part of the world to tell any one of them from any other? Nor was this our only trouble. We were great novices besides in handling a canoe. The portages were almost beyond our strength, so that I have seen us sit down in despair for half an hour at a time without one word, and the appearance of a single Indian, since we had now no means of speaking to them, would have been in all probability the means of our destruction. There is altogether some excuse if Ballantrae showed something of a glooming disposition. His habit of imputing blame to others, quite as capable as himself, was less tolerable, and his language it was not always easy to accept. Indeed, he had contracted on board the pirate ship a manner of address which was, in a high degree, unusual between gentlemen, and now, when you might say he was in a fever, it increased upon him hugely. The third day of these wanderings, as we were carrying the canoe upon a rocky portage, she fell and was entirely bilged. The portage was between two lakes, both pretty extensive. The track, such as it was, opened at both ends upon the water, and on both hands was enclosed by the unbroken woods and the sides of the lakes were quite impassable with bog, so that we beheld ourselves not only condemned to go without our boat and the greater part of our provisions, but to plunge at once into impenetrable thickets, and to desert what little guidance we still had, the course of the river. Each stuck his pistols in his belt, shouldered an axe, made a pack of his treasure, and as much food as he could stagger under, and, deserting the rest of our possessions, even to our swords, which would have much embarrassed us among the woods, we set forth on this deplorable adventure. The labours of Hercules, so finely described by Homer, were a trifle to what we now underwent. Some parts of the forest were perfectly dense down to the ground, so that we must cut our way like mites in a cheese. In some, the bottom was full of deep swamp and the whole wood entirely rotten. I have leaped on a great fallen log and sunk to the knees in touchwood. I have sought to stay myself in falling against what looked to be a solid trunk, 
and the whole thing has whiffed away at my touch like a sheet of paper stumbling falling bogging to the knees hewing our way our eyes almost put out with twigs and branches our clothes plucked from our bodies we laboured all day and it is doubtful if we made two miles what was worse as we could rarely get a view of the country and were perpetually jostled from our path by obstacles it was impossible even to have a guess in what direction we were moving a little before sundown in an open place with a stream and set about with barbarous mountains ballantrae threw down his pack i will go no further said he and bade me light the fire damning my blood in terms not proper for a chairman i told him to try to forget he had ever been a pirate and to remember he had been a gentleman are you mad he cried don't cross me here and then shaking his fist at the hills to think cries he that i must leave my bones in this miserable wilderness would god i had died upon the scaffold like a gentleman this he said ranting like an actor and then sat biting his fingers and staring on the ground a most unchristian object i took a certain horror of the man for i thought a soldier and a gentleman should confront his end with more philosophy i made him no reply therefore in words and presently the evening fell so chill that i was glad for my own sake to kindle a fire and yet god knows in such an open spot and the country alive with savages the act was little short of lunacy ballantrae seemed never to observe me but at last as i was about parching a little corn he looked up have you ever a brother said he by the blessing of heaven said i not less than five i have the one said he with a strange voice and then presently he shall pay me for all this he added and when i asked him what was his brother's part in our distress what he cried he sits in my place he bears my name he courts my wife and i am here alone with a damned irishman in this tooth-chattering desert oh i have been a common gull he cried the explosion was in all ways so far into my friend's nature that i was daunted out of all my just susceptibility sure an offensive expression however vivacious appears a wonderfully small affair in circumstances so extreme but here there is a strange thing to be noted he had only once before referred to the lady with whom he was contracted that was when we came in view of the town of new york when he had told me if all had their rights he was now in sight of his own property for miss graham enjoyed a large estate in the province and this was certainly a natural occasion but now here she was named a second time and what is surely fit to be observed in this very month which was november forty seven and i believe upon that very day as we sat among these barbarous mountains his brother and miss gray were married i am the least superstitious of men but the hand of providence is here displayed too openly not to be remarked note by mr mckellar a complete blunder there was at this date no word of the marriage see above in my own narration return to text the next day and the next were passed in similar labours ballantrae often deciding on our course by the spinning of a coin and once when i expostulated on this childishness he had an odd remark that i have never forgotten i know no better way said he to express my scorn of human reason i think it was the third day that we found the body of a christian scalped and most abominably mangled and lying in a putter of his blood the birds of the desert screaming over him as thick as flies i cannot describe how dreadfully the sight affected us but it robbed me of all strength and all hope for this world the same day and only a little after we were scrambling over a part of the forest that had been burned when ballantrae who was a little ahead ducked suddenly behind a fallen trunk i joined him in this shelter whence we could look abroad without being seen ourselves 
and in the bottom of the next vale beheld a large war-party of the savages going by across our line there might be the value of a weak battalion present all naked to the waist blacked with grease and soot and painted with white lead and vermilion according to their beastly habits they went one behind another like a string of geese and at a quickish trot so that they took but a little while to rattle by and disappear again among the woods yet i suppose we endured a greater agony of hesitation and suspense in these few minutes than goes usually to a man's whole life whether they were french or english indians whether they desired scouts or prisoners whether we should declare ourselves upon the chance or lie quiet and continue the heart-breaking business of our journey sure i think these were questions to have puzzled the brains of aristotle himself ballantry turned to me with a face all wrinkled up and his teeth showing in his mouth like what i have read of people starving he said no word but his whole appearance was a kind of dreadful question they may be of the english side i whispered and think the best we could then hope is to begin this over again i know i know he said yet it must come to a plunge at last and he suddenly plucked out his coin shook it in his closed hands looked at it and then laid down with his face in the dust edition by mr mckellar i dropped the chevalier's narration at this point because the couple quarrelled and separated the same day and the chevalier's account of the quarrel seems to me i must confess quite incompatible with the nature of either of the men henceforth they wandered alone undergoing extraordinary sufferings until first one and then the other was picked up by a party from fort st frederick only two things are to be noted and first as most important for my purpose that the master in the course of his miseries buried his treasure at a point never since discovered but of which he took a drawing in his own blood on the lining of his hat and second that on his coming thus penniless to the fort he was welcomed like a brother by the chevalier who thence paid his way to france the simplicity of mr burke's character leads him at this point to praise the master exceedingly to an eye more worldly wise it would seem it was the chevalier alone that was to be commended i have the more pleasure in pointing to this really very noble trait of my esteemed correspondent as i fear i may have wounded him immediately before i have refrained from comments on any of his extraordinary and in my eyes immoral opinions for i know him to be jealous of respect but his version of the quarrel is really more than i can reproduce for i knew the master myself and a man more insusceptible of fear is not conceivable i regret this oversight of the chevalier's and all the more because the tenor of his narrative set aside a few flourishes strikes me as highly ingenuous End of chapter three recording by thomas copeland